So let's talk about investing. And as I do, I thought you might like to know that the average American car loan right now, that the average person has, stands at 30,000 bucks. That's pretty high if you ask me. Oh, and get this, the average American has $15,000 charged up on their credit card. Unbelievable. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, those aren't facts about investing, those are facts about just the opposite, debt. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and you do want me to mention something about investing or at least saving? Well, here you go. The average American has less than one month's worth of living expense in their savings account, meaning they couldn't even eke it out for a month if they lost their job or all their income and everything would go to pot. Good grief. And here we are, and we're going to talk about investing today. Some of you might be thinking, well, gee, this one's going to go over like a lead balloon. <laughs> but you know what? I don't think so. I think that this is going to be great today. And you know why? Because we're talking here today as the people of God, and we're talking about investing in God's kingdom. And I'm going to tell you some trends that we've been seeing right here that give me great hope that God's people are going to grasp onto this. I'm going to give you the bad news and then the good news. First of all, the bad news. I did a little statistical study, and if you look at the year 2019 for the first three quarters of the year, I use 2019 because that's the last year that was normal before the <coughs> pandemic, good old days, 2019 and before, and you take the first three quarters of this year, 2022, okay, and if you compare in this church what the worship attendance was back in 2019 and what it is now, we are down 21%. We've lost 21% of our attendees, or might, they might be here, but they're not coming. As, there's just not as many people coming here regularly. It's down. And that's not good. And some of you might be thinking, well, is that for some of the traditional reasons that we normally think of? Was there some big fight or some big stink going on here? Speak, speaking of stink, is it because you, Jensen, haven't been taking a bath and people can't stand to be around you? No, I get cleaned up most Sunday, most Sunday morning, yes, mostly I do. Did the local, I don't know, employer or factory or business in town pull out and everybody moved away? That happens in small town. No, not around here. None of that happened. The world has really changed in three years. I mean, you even talk to like the Lions Club or social organizations, this or that. People just aren't behaving the way they used to. It's a different world. It's tough. So I'm not excusing it, but I'm just saying it's a fact. We're down 21%. That's bad. Now, here's the good news. Even though we have 21% less attendees here than we did three years ago, the tithes and offerings are up 12%. We have less people and yet more generosity happening. That's amazing, and that's why I think that when we talk about making disciples, developing, discovering, developing, and de deploying, that's the third word, disciples for Jesus Christ, as we've been doing, as we wrap it up now as a reminder that if we're serious about this, we're going to have to be generous. We're going to have to place our resources of all kinds in kingdom investments in making disciples I have great faith that the people of God are going to get this, and we're going to grab hold of it, and we're going to move forward as generous people. I just have great faith. I do. So, with no further ado, let's talk about it now. Let's talk about placing your resources in kingdom investments, what that is all about. And the first thing we'll do is we'll give you a little background so that you know what we're talking about. The scripture passage today 
doesn't apply 100% to the topic that we're talking about, and that is taking your investments and investing in discipleship, but it does give us a lot of clues about generosity and how the Christian is called by God to be a generous believer. And the background is, is you have a story here, where, or a text, if you will, where one group of Christians pledges to share its resources with another. Um, from 2 Corinthians 8 and other passages, we put together that what's going on at the time that this was written is that the Christians in Jerusalem were in a very bad way. They had acute needs. And uh, the Apostle Paul and his companions were encouraging other believers in other areas to be generous towards those needy saints in Jerusalem. And the Corinthians made a commitment to be a part of this. So Paul was sending Titus uh, to collect donations from different believers uh, to make sure that it got to Jerusalem. And um, that's what they were doing. Let's just take care of our own. Let's take care of these other believers in need. Now, some of you might be saying, wait a minute. Was this the ancient world form of socialism or communism? No. <laughs> this wasn't the government or even an ecclesiastical church government coming in and saying, okay, we're going to take what's yours and we're going to give it to someone else or we're going to put a gun to your head if you don't do that. It's nothing like that. No tax, no coercion, nothing like that. It was all generosity. And you may wonder, or wait a minute, was it just a case of general benevolent Christian giving, sort of like we see with New Hope Ministries, where God's people give to the needs of anyone. That's a good thing, but that's not what's going on here. What's actually happening is one group of Christians is resourcing another group of Christians who were in need, okay? And that was a New Testament model. If you don't believe me, look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 45. That's just what they did. In Acts 2.42, the early church was described in this way, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all those who and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. See, it was voluntary. They just wanted to bless and help one another. <coughs> now, if anyone is saying, well, but wait a minute, that was Christians helping other Christians. Is that a little bit bigoted? What about other people out there that aren't believers and they're in need too? Well, yeah, we need to bless other people as well, but there's an interesting pattern we see in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. The Apostle Paul said to the Galatians, So then, as we have opportunity, let's do good to everyone. Everyone means everyone. Do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Did you catch that? Yes, do good. Be generous to everyone. But, oh boy, you make extra sure you take care of those who are part of the household of faith, your brothers and sisters in Christ. So, you might be saying, okay, one group of Christians helping another. What in the world does this have to do with discovering, developing, and deploying disciples? What, what does this have to do with that? There are passages in this, or there are principles, excuse me, in this passage that we find that will help us as we share with others, as we develop others into disciples, as God calls us to be generous with them, there's a lot we can learn that was going on right here. And that's why, finally, we're going to look at it now. The main text is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 14. And we invite you to turn there at this time in 2 Corinthians 9. It can be found on page 1150 of your pew Bibles, or we encourage you to use your own Bible if you have it with you, or call it up on an app on your tablet or phone. 2 Corinthians 9, 1 through 14. Beginning at verse 1, Paul says, Now it is superfluous, you like that word that they use in the ESV, superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry of the saints. 
For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if I come, or otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will, be, will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. A lot packed in there. Let's get to it. First thing that we have is advice about sharing resources with other Christians. As Paul reminds the Corinthians to remember this, Christian generosity can excite other Christians. Oh yeah, it spreads. No question about it. Paul was aware of the Corinthians being so ready to give their generosity. He knew they were ready. He says so here in verses 1 and 2. And he tells them that. I've been bragging about you to the people over in Macedonia. I said Achaia has been ready since last year. In case you're wondering, what does he mean by Achaia? Achaia was the region in which the city of Corinth was located. So if you lived in Corinth, you were from Achaia. So obviously the Corinthians and other people in Achaia were ready to give, and that was a really, really, really good thing. They were excited. They were ready to go, and Paul couldn't help but share it with others, the Macedonians, and they were getting all excited to give as well. It's kind of like what you hear happening at Dunkin' Donuts in the drive through around the holidays that pay it forward. You ever see that on the news where, you know, one person after another, one customer pays for the next person's coffee and donuts and the next one and the next one? You know, that's... Uh, that's neat when that happens. That's what's happening here. When Christians become generous, other Christians see that and they get excited and they want to get in on the deal as well. So it spreads like a wildfire. Now, because of that, we need to remember this. Fulfill any commitment you make to be generous. Because failing to do so can bring reproach. That's a warning from Paul here to the Corinthians in verses 3, 4, and 5. That's why in verse 3 he's sending the brothers to the Corinthians just to remind them. Does he maybe not trust them? Mm, I don't know about that, but he wants to make extra sure that they do their commitment. You said you're going to be generous. It's spreading like a wildfire. Fulfill your commitment. And he says to them, because otherwise if the Macedonians find out that you bummed out on the deal, um, we're going to be humiliated. You'll be humiliated. It will be a mess. The reputation of all of us is on the line. So I think that what we need to take from that is knowing that generosity is such an awesome thing that if you pledge or say you're going to be generous, follow through with that. 
unless you yourself fall into some sort of financial trap and can't meet the commitment. Otherwise, make sure that you keep your commitment to be generous. Otherwise, it can hurt a lot of people. Now, moving on then in verses 6, or in verse 6, I should say, Paul says, blessings reaped are proportional to generous acts sown. Meaning when you decide to be generous, using the analogy of a farmer or agriculture, if you sow a lot, you're going to get a lot of blessings in the harvest or the reaping. But you know what? If you sow only a little bit, you're only going to get a little bit of blessings whenever it's time to reap the harvest. It's a proportional relationship. A lot of sowing, a lot of blessings, a lot of harvest. Little sowing, little blessings, if you will, little harvest. There was a farmer who was a Christian in Canada that was trying to teach this to a group of students, and apparently he had one of these big, huge corporate farms, and uh, what uh, he did was um, he asked some of the people with them, do you know how I plant grain and what would I do and how it happens? And they said, no, we're not sure. So he took just a handful of seeds of the grain and he went out and he dropped one right in front of him. Then he walked ahead another three feet and he dropped another one. And then he dropped another one and another one. And after about a half a dozen of them, he said, okay, I'm done. And they looked at him and they said, you got to be kidding me. That's how you plant? And he said, no. And he said, this is what I do. He said, you see that big truck over there? Yeah. I take it down to the supply, and I get a whole truckload of seeds. Then I bring it back here, and do you see that seed spreader there, that big machine? Yeah. I put it in there, and I go up and down these fields everywhere, and I scatter a lot, a lot of seeds, because that's how you get a big harvest. And his point was, is if you want to see God really work and see God do his thing blessing others, we need to sow blessings and sow generosity so that those blessings are great in the lives of others. That's how it works. It's just like farming. Pretty neat stuff. Then in verse 7, Paul says this, generosity must come inwardly from the heart, not outwardly from through compulsion. There was a missionary who went to a place in the third world where it was developing, and, and um, he went to their worship service for this particular group of people, and they did things a little bit differently than we would do things here when it came to the offering. And this is what they did. You remember how we brought the offering forward and sang, Give Thanks, and I think it was Timmy, and it was Matt. You guys did that today. Thank you, gentlemen. Men, how would you like it if we hire you to do that again or ask you to do it again? We're not paying you. And next Sunday when you do it, not only are we singing, but we get you guys to dance on your way up. I don't know. Matt doesn't look like he's ready to dance. Now, Timmy is. Okay, so we have a split decision here. These people that the missionary went to visit, that's what they did. They brought the offering forward with singing and dancing. And this, this missionary said, what, what are you guys doing? And you know what the answer was? They said, we are so grateful for what God has done for us in Jesus. And besides, you know the Bible says that we're to be cheerful givers. That's why we dance the offering up the aisle. Well, there you go. That's a pretty good answer, isn't it? And this is the idea. God wants us to be cheerful givers givers, that it naturally comes from us, cheerfully, not under compulsion. Now, if you want an example of what under compulsion is, I have four words for you. Paying federal income taxes. <laughs> Do you ever notice the difference between paying taxes and then giving to the work of the Lord of something you're excited about? Big difference between the two. In other words, being generous is not to be like taxes. It's to be a spirit of cheerfulness. And that's what Paul is saying. So we want to pray that we would have a cheerful giving attitude, not a taxation attitude. And then we see this. This is the final major point. 
Generosity produces many blessings. It does. First of all, for the giver. Did you ever think about that? Whenever we are generous with other people, we are blessed. How so? It's because God gives us the grace so that we can even be more generous. You start being generous with someone else, God's going to say, okay, I'm going to enable you to be even more generous. Now, Paul uses a quote from the Old Testament here in verse 9 after he makes that point in verse 8. And that quote comes from Psalm 112 in verse 9, and I'm going to read it in its original context very briefly. It says this in Psalm 112 in verse 9, He has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever, his horn is exalted in honor. Who's that talking about? The context of Psalm 112 is this. Psalm 112 is about a man who fears the Lord and delights in his law. And because he does that, God blesses this man with material blessings. This isn't prosperity gospel. This isn't that. It's something different. It's just that the man comes along, he's not looking to get rich and saying, oh, right, then I'm going to serve God and be, pray to God so he makes me. No, 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 no. He just loves the Lord, and then the Lord blesses that man. And then what does he do? He takes those blessings, doesn't keep it from for himself, but then takes and scatters it abroad to the poor. That's how it works. We love God. He blesses us, and then we want to bless others even more. So there's the blessing. God gives you the grace and the ability to even be more generous. And in verse 14, get this. The recipients of our generosity, they'll pray for us. You ever think about that? Many times when one Christian blesses another, that one who's on the receiving end is so grateful, he prays for the person who was generous with him or with her. We see that all the time. That's how we see that generosity produces many blessings. But also, obviously so, it produces blessings for the recipient. And Paul makes this clear. Obviously, their needs will be met. The needs of the saints in Jerusalem are being met, according to verse 12. We also know that those saints that are blessed by us, as we are generous, they will be thankful to God, and yes, they will even glorify God, verse 13. How does this work? Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 5, and verses 14 through 16. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Wow. Did you ever think about that? That me, just little old me, if I bless someone else, that may cause that person to give glory to God. You know, it shouldn't come to me. It shouldn't come to me. We don't want that. We want to give glory to God. That will happen. That's how God works. So now, how does this apply to disciple making? Well, how do we invest in disciples' kingdom impact? Very briefly, and I'm going to fly through these, I'm going to say generously by sharing our three T's. Not t-shirts like you're welcome to wear tonight, but other T's. Talents, treasure, and time. Your talents would be those natural abilities that you have if you're great at organizing things. Thank you, decluttering team. You're doing a good job. Uh, maybe you're able to help people think through things. Maybe you're a funny person. You can be humorous. I, how can that be used in developing a disciple? Use it. Use it generously. Treasure. Obviously, that goes more to what we said in the 2 Corinthians 9 passage. Is there some way in which the person that you are working with or developing into a disciple, that they will benefit from your material generosity? Are they in need? Do they need your help in some way? Well, go ahead and bless them. Help them. Do that. Obviously, they did it in biblical times. It's okay to do it now. It's good to do it now. And then also our time. Mm -hmm. That's the one you think, oh my word, I don't have a lot of time. You know what, folks? We have time for the things that we love. And if we love God's kingdom, 
and we want to see his kingdom come and his will be done, and we're serious about investing in the lives of making disciples of others, then we will find the time to share our time with them. And there you have it. That's what it's all about, investing in the disciples' kingdom impact. Time, treasure, talent, it's all worth it. And if anyone here is thinking, I'm not so sure about that, just remember what Jesus said about this whole matter in the Sermon on the Mount. It's a heart issue. He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So let's pray to the Lord to develop us so that our hearts would be ready to be generous and ready to make disciples. And as we pour our lives into developing disciples through our generous time, talents, and treasure, you watch out. This bit about attendance is down by 21%. It'll be up by 100% one way or another, whether it's here or in small groups or in a satellite service or in a church plant or something else. It will happen. Amen and amen.